Hello, my name is Cecily Jensen Clayton, and I'm a member of the Entrepreneurial Research Community. We're a group of researchers committed to extending our research capacities for the future, as well as learning from other researchers. And today we welcome Dr. Deborah Eddy. Deborah is an activist artist. Deborah, we look forward to hearing from you, about you, and about your ways of working to create impact. So now over to you, Deborah. Thank you very much, Cecily. I look forward to being part of this ERC conversation. I'm just going to share my slides. So I'm just going to share my screen. Share. And can you see that, Cecily? Yes, absolutely. There we go. So, firstly, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a rundown about my work and the sort of work that I make. Well, this image that you you can see muted in the background, I actually don't have a costume on, unless you consider underwear a costume. I generally make costumes and perform in them. So I'm what is known as a performance artist. And the sort of work that I make has been initially in concer concerning the invisibility of ageing women and the um, pressure to stay young and age successfully, which is what this image, Iron Out the Wrinkles, is about, where you're just trying to do the impossible. The other sort of work that I've been making is about the domestic burden that women carry. We do far more of the caring and domestic work than our male partners. I can't comment on uh, people who are in a different sort of relationship, but I do know from a heterosexual point of view um, that it's generally heavily weighted on the women's shoulders to do the greater part of caring and domestic labour. And this doesn't change as you get older. Um, it just seems that you have more time in the house and so wind up doing a bit more. I understand that a lot of people, you know, it's a choice to, to, to be like that. But uh, with something that I was actually brought up with was my mother was uh, didn't work outside of the home and to her, everything had to be clean and spotless. And unfortunately, I don't seem to be able to shake that. This is another work about that women's labor. And in this work, you can clearly see this costume that I've made, which is styled after a sort of 1950s apron. And it is part of a series of three photos, which you can see here, which was displayed at the Judith Wright Centre in Brunswick Street in Brisbane. And it's titled Women, W is for Women's Work. And it's highlighting the type of domestic labour that um, women do. And another way of highlighting that is my materials which you can see uh, high-vis and the apron itself is made from those high-vis bib uh, vests that get worn on building sites. I'm just going to talk a bit about um, activist art and my first slide might surprise some people, Artemisia Gentilesti. And she can be considered as one of the first feminist activist artists with her work. 
Artemisia's father was an artist and in the uh, Renaissance period, that was how women actually, well, most people learned how to paint was um, as a companion to an artist who was recognised. And so as her father's daughter, she sat by his easel and she made her own work or indeed probably worked on some of his work. This painting that we can see here is known as a chiaroscura style of painting, very dramatic, light and dark. And an artist that was a contemporary at the time Artemisia was painting was Caravaggio. And so this type of this style of painting was um, very highly sought, of, sought after. And the subject matter here is Judith slaying Holofernes. Unfortunately for Artemisia, she was raped at a young age by one of her father's studio assistants and went through a horrendous court case where she had to prove that she was innocent, not the other way around. And so the types of artwork that she tended to make was about that um, female existence of um, trying to triumph over that male patriarchy, I suppose you would call it. I'm jumping forward in this very brief history of feminist activist art to Martha Rosler who was um, and still is a very activist, a very active and activist artist. She is an American and she made this work at, during the time of the Vietnam War. It looks at a number of things. It's looking at that sort of domestic goddess that was um, so well I suppose, con considered in those days by the patriarch patriarchal society. And in this image, we see a woman uh, vacuuming curtains, but the view out of the window are men in a trench. And as we know now, or we knew then, the Vietnam War was the first war that we saw in our lounge room day in, day out. And so it was something that we couldn't sort of hide from. And the other thing with the sort of American perspective of it was that complicity um, in the war. And so Martha Rosler is, is bringing that to our attention in this picture that she's made, which is a collage of photographs, <clears throat> excuse me, very cleverly put together. This group of women, the Knitting Nanas, is an Australian group of women who are activists. And they sit at mine sites, politicians' offices, anywhere where they can actually get across their, um, their activism that we should not be fracking, um, we shouldn't be mining, we should be looking after the environment. And their, their catch cry is that it's they are looking after the environment for the kiddies. So they're nanas and they want the, the environment cared for for their grandchildren. And as we know, um, the environment is in a perilous state. And um, I'm starting to make some new work, some new environmental work. And in my research, um, you may be interested to know, or already know this, but the doomsday clock is now 90 seconds to midnight, midnight being the apocalypse that will end us all. So the work that activist artists do, particularly environmental artists, uh, is very important in bringing to the public 
in a way that is probably more palatable or maybe even more easily understood than scientists and the, the I suppose, st statistics that are given to us about global warming and the degrees of temperature and what we should be doing in our household to stop, like we shouldn't be using gas and, and, and that sort of thing, which I think, unless it's done with some sense of humour, which the nanas do, it, it just falls on, it can fall on deaf ears and it's like just the same old, same old, which perhaps if we go back to Martha Rosler, the Vietnam, Vietnam War went on and on and there was a lot of protests about it, but people were just tired of it and chose to turn a blind eye. I think, though, at this point in time, we all know that it's getting beyond where we can turn a blind eye. So these women, their colour palette is yellow and, black, yellow and black. They don't just knit, they do all sorts of crafts. Um, if they're at a mine site, they actively engage with the police who are, are there to ensure that um, the mining goes ahead. They'll give them icy poles if it's a hot day, glasses of water. They care for anybody who else who's an activist there. So they're, to me, a very inspirational group of women and they are performance artists in what they do. This work here is, I suppose, a response to the Knitting Nanas and it's called C is for climate change. And you see in this work, I'm sitting with the water lapping around my ankles and I'm knitting in that, that the, the colors of the Knitting Nanas and I'm knitting caution tape. So it's operating on a couple of levels. It's high vis, but you can see the word caution. And the sky looks ominous. Perhaps it's going to, we're going to have another one of those big floods. Um, I am sitting by the bay. I'm not um, by a river or, or anything like that, but the bay did flood uh, where I live and several houses were inundated. So it is an important consideration, the rising sea levels. Then my next slide is, um, this time last year I was conferred um, and it, as a doctorate of visual art, the majority of my examination is to make visual art and my thesis um, is a lesser part in in the structure, but ultimately seems to be over, overwhelmingly more when you're going through it. But that's that's by the side, and you're all going through your own doctoral battles, I'm sure. So this work here is called "We Are Old Women Hear Us Roar," and I rewrote the lyrics. Um, to We Are Women, um, I Am Women, Helen Reddy's feminist anthem, to encapsulate the um, research I'd done in my, for this doctorate and for my thesis. So it talks about the invisibility of aging women. It talks about how we want to walk, walk beside our, our younger sisters in terms of activism. And it also talks about the fact that domestic violence happens to older women. It's, it's often buried as elder abuse, but it's at the end of the day, it's domestic violence. And it talks also about how women, older women are an increasing cohort of homeless in Australia and probably around the world. And that is another, that homelessness can also in other parts of the world, probably even here too, after the floods and bushfires, link to climate change to some extent as well. So the performance, I had about 40 women with me 
and they were all wearing those pink vests. And on the back, I'd spray painted, we are old women, hear us roar. And they roared the chorus and I recited the poem. I did so in King George Square in Brisbane. And we see behind us a suffragette with her umbre umbrella raised. Um, and if I could remember her name, I would tell you, but unfortunately that has slipped out of my brain. So it was an important site for me to, to have that, um, that demonstration, I suppose you'd call it. Um, and that's all I've got to say. I look forward to Cecily actually questioning me further. Um, you can contact me on either of those platforms. That's where I put my artwork. And just briefly, um, a whole bunch of references uh, that might be of interest to you as well. So I'll just escape out of this and we'll return to Cecily and just bear with me a minute while I do that. And here we are. Well, thank you so much, um, Deborah. That was absolutely quite uh, inspiring. And I found it very educational at the same time. It was great to hear about uh, your work and I can see the impact that it would have. The question that's just arising in my mind as I watched that, and I thought to myself, has Deborah always been an artist? Have you always been an artist, Deborah? I, I suppose I have been. One of my earliest memories is on the back veranda at my parents' house in West Ride in New South Wales, in Sydney at one of those A-frame um, blackboards drawing. And apparently I, I drew all the time. I, after high school, I went to, um, to tech uh, to study graphic design, but I, I wound up getting married and having kids really young. And so I guess my art career was put on hold for a while. But I think when you're an artist, you you, you do and, you, and see things differently to other people. So, I mean, it's even how I probably curate my house in terms of my belongings, my artwork, like the artwork that I collect. If I, if I do a lunch, the table's always done in a particular way. So I think art is something that, it just runs through your life. And then I was doing courses here and there, um, life drawing and all sorts of things. And I was reading in the Australian, Saturday Australian paper, the, the weekend magazine. This would be probably 12 years, 12, 12 13 years ago that you could do a visual arts degree online through Curtin University in WA. So I signed up for that and I did that for several years online, but it's, ex it's exceptionally difficult to do visual art in a degree subject online because you, you don't have a cohort of people around you to talk about your artwork, you don't, you know, in a room with artists talking, you tutor us at the end. And this was before Zoom too, so it was even more difficult. Anyway, I managed to get um, enough credits and, um, and good passes to be accepted at Queensland College of Art. And that was nine years ago now. And I did a Bachelor of Visual Arts I went into honours and I got first class honours, which got me in to do my doctorate. And I did that. So I was at uni for eight years solid. And it was the most fantastic experience. And it took me places in the world that I hadn't been to before. And I met, I've met so many wonderful people and had so many 
great opportunities to having this this art life that I didn't even know that I actually could have. And so whenever I'm with older people, or if I can, I talk about that ability that we have as older people to actually go and have a a life of of learning and that it's not out of anyone's grasp. And I think if anything, doing this, having this eight years at uni has shown me that it's there. You just you just need to have the wherewithal in yourself to grab it. Thank you. Um, that's given us a lovely picture of uh, yourself, you know, and how you have persevered. You've loved your art that much. You've kept persevering throughout your life and you're still um, persevering with it and uh, enjoying it and making a difference in the world. So this is um, incredible and it's an inspiration to other older people too, as you say, who can keep learning and keep growing and keep uh, making a contribution um, to our troubled world at the moment. Um, I'm just thinking about since you finished your PhD, once you finished it, what was the future that was, or the futures that were um, unfolding for you, or did you have to work at unfolding them for yourself to reinvent yourself <laughs> to fit the world that had grown um, while you were so spending your eight years um, studying and doing a PhD? <laughs> yeah. Cecily, I had to reinvent myself again, really. I thought after I'd finished my, my PhD that... Um, the world would be my oyster, but at 68, the world doesn't consider 68-year-old women have a great deal to, to offer. Not everybody, but there's a general consensus that um, we've probably had a, had a go at life and so it's the, it's time for younger people and I'm, I'm totally... In a grants that young people need to have their time. So I realised that I wasn't going to have all of these things land on my lap just because I was suddenly a doctor, that I would have to work whatever it was that I wanted to get out of having that, that, uh, that qualification. I... I have been working for the last oh, three years in an art gallery. So that has given me the ability to talk to people about art, the visitors who come in. And I run workshops um, on various subjects. But more recently, I've started teaching kids art of an afternoon after school through the gallery. And that is just been the most wonderful experience and I really love teaching little kids and giving them just little nuggets of what I've learned about drawing and paint and the colour wheel and how to make a 3D object and I just hope that just one or two of those kids it will spark in them something and they too will have, you know, a nice, a nice career in in the arts. Not a nice career, but a career. It might open something up for them, and they might remember, hopefully kindly, the mad woman trying to get them to draw perspective after school. So, but the other side of life after that that PhD is. As an artist, the way you, the only way you can get your artwork out there is to keep putting proposals forward to commercial galleries or galleries, really regional galleries are more the type of gallery that would pick up my work and to enter competitions. So between now and the end of June, I have six different competitions that I'm making artwork for and entering these competitions and 
a couple of those are for environmental art and so I'm making new work there and they all have prize money so you always hope that you'll earn a few few dollars because as an artist I can tell you unless you have some side hustle you're not going to be earning cheap stations making artwork so I guess after initially after I finished I applied for a whole bunch of things that I got rejected from and it took a while to come back from that and I think after you've finished you're really tired it's a very emotional it's a roller coaster particularly if getting towards the end doesn't isn't as smooth as you'd hoped it would be and so it took me a while um, to actually start making artwork again and then you crucify yourself because you're not making artwork and you can see everybody else is making artwork. It's a very, it's um, not a cruisy sort of um, career option. But when you do do things and you make things and people do like them and see the validity in them, it does make it all worthwhile. Mm. And I'm really seeing that your own personal um, development and professional development and the increase in your art. I can see after you finish the PhD and you've, you know, had that period of reinvention and the experiences that go along with that, when you pick yourself up, I can see that, you know, uh, with your development, so your art would be developing. Would I be right? The impact, your art would be coming even stronger. The impact oh, would be yeah. greater through this experience of reinvention. Yeah, I, 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 well, I hope that's the case. I mean, when you're at uni, you've got your supervisor and a cohort of people around you that you can run things by. But once you've finished, um, sure, you've still got artists around you that you can sort of reach out to. Um, but you don't have that, I guess you've got to drive yourself, really. At uni, if you don't push yourself to meet those deadlines, your supervisor, supervisor will certainly come after you. So once you leave, you've got to, you have to come up with the ideas yourself. As you know, when you're doing your PhD, you have your research question that you're working towards. But once you've done that and you've finished, then you have to come up with your own research questions, if you like, your own things that are burning for you to make work on. And so when I, I finished, I, I was sort of still in the making work about, I suppose, the invisibility of ageing women and and feminist issues, which is still very important to me. But the further I've gotten away from the finish line, the more I'm starting to see other research possibilities to make work about. And I think as an older person, as a grandmother, it behooves me to make work about climate change because my grandkids are certainly not in for the, the cruisy life that we had as kids when we were young. And so it's really important to me to make work about that and to, to research about that. So the, the sorts of things that I'm researching about now are ecofeminism and um, environmental activist art and that sort of I suppose research question is how can how can artists actually make a difference and make it more visible to to people and in the hope that it'll start conversations and they'll they'll make changes that need to be done or even if it's like politically to make a change um, whatever it might be that would would start to push things um, in in a better direction than we're going at the moment. 
Thank you so much for this conversation, Deborah. It's been a pleasure speaking with you and you've offered some great insights there and people around the world, I'm sure, will gain something from your insights. So thank you. Bye for now, Deborah. Thank you, Cecily. And bye, you. everyone. Bye -bye. Thanks for listening and looking. <laughs>